in the afternoon of our command day, we always have a little bit of fun talking about the AML aircraft maintenance log. In air navigation order, it is the technical log. And if you'll forgive me, I'm going to call it the tech log so we know precisely what we're talking about. In British Airways, it's split into two. There's our bit, if you like, and our other bit. Notice I said our other bit, because the technical log belongs to you, Commander. It belongs to you because it is your responsibility to write in it. And that means that it's your responsibility to write in both parts of it. For those of you who are familiar with flying with a flight engineer, the flight engineer filled out all of the tech log and then presented it to the captain for his approval and signature. And that's exactly what the CSD does does, not should do, does, for you. So if he can't spell, or if he hasn't filled the tech log, that part of the tech log in properly, then it's your responsibility to do just that. Now, the technical log. The air navigation order says that there shall be one. The air navigation order says that you, commander, will fill it in. And um, I would like to go through one or two aspects of the uh, aspects of airworthiness that are relevant. Okay, so let's start. We've just flown to Boeing and we're going to pick up a brand new airplane. It has a new crisp certificate of airworthiness. It has been signed out. I'll uh, come back to that. But it is absolutely pristine. Nothing in the technology at all, and I ask the question, is it airworthy? I answer, of course it is. Okay. It's airworthy, you take it flying. So when you take it flying and bring it back, you, Commander, are responsible for putting one of two things into the technical log. Like that there were nil defects or the specific defects that you found on your flight and you have to sign and date it that's what the law says now in British Airways if you think about our tech log like this right it's split into two don't don't worry about this bit because we're going to come and talk a little bit about that later but it's split into two and you commander are going to put Neil here in the event that on your flight there were no defects. So the question is, when you come for the next flight, assuming that it was signed out, come back to that in a moment, and you see nil writ there and the commander's signature of the previous flight there, have you got an airworthy airplane? Answer, yes. Okay, go fly. Brilliant. Because you, of course, are not permitted to go flying unless you have an airworthy aeroplane. You pause there just for a moment. How many of you routinely, when it's your sector, check the certificate of airworthiness or the certificate of flying generally on the aircraft? And if I ask that of a class of people, almost nobody will put their hand up. Now, Okay, that's okay because you're not yet a captain. But if you are a captain, you have transgressed. It is a requirement under the air navigation order that you check not only the of airworthiness but the other relevant documents that are in one of the schedules of the air navigation order are on board the aircraft. More importantly, it's written in currently the chapter 15 of flying crew orders that you, commander, shall check. So what I do is when I put my hat in the hat rack on 747, I get the yellow book out, I open it, and I check it. It takes me, what, 20 seconds, 30 seconds? It's a routine, it's a subroutine, and I do it without fail. And I, therefore, have complied with two aspects. I've complied with the air navigation order, and I've complied with British Airways standard operating procedures. And that's the first part, the first part of checking that the aeroplane is airworthy. 
Now you could say, oh Colin, that's bloody stupid, it's a delegated responsibility to engineering to put these difficult files on board the aircraft. True. But the air navigation order says that it's your responsibility to check and it is not as against the load sheet, right, which I'll come back to, something that the operating procedures of British Airways allows you, Commander, to delegate. So therefore you have that responsibility. It isn't a delegated responsibility. Do it. And if you do it routinely, it's just a matter of habit. Like most subroutines, strategies. Certificate of airworthiness. Okay. So let's just think about this then. That the that instead of instead of the aeroplane coming in with nil defects, it says aircraft broke. Right? Signature at the bottom. So the question is. Is the aeroplane airworthy? Answer, no. Absolutely not, because it's got a defect on it. Okay? Now, one of several things can happen, but let us just live with the fact that it's arrived. Aircraft broke is written this side, and the good engineer writes in aircraft fixed, and signs it and dates, signs it with his um, his license number uh, and all of those good things. So aircraft broke, aircraft fixed. Have we got an airworthy aeroplane subject to be, being signed out on a ramp check and all those things? Answer, yes. Okay. Now, something about that aircraft fixed. If you think back to looking at uh, a defect page and it says number one engine failed, number one engine replaced. If you think about that replacement procedure, there are probably a thousand tasks that are individually ticked off by engineering. And that the guy who writes aircraft fixed engine one changed, run satisfactorily or whatever is in here, this side, has by his responsibility checked off all the things that need to be done so that the engine is serviceable. And that means to say that in the same way as you, Commander, writing in that side with your signature, a qualified licensed engineer, of which British Airways has got many, writing off in that side with his a signature and his license number is in effect a guarantee that as far as he is able to tell the aeroplane is serviceable, or that defect has been cleared, and therefore the airplane is airworthy in that regard. So we're talk talking about a single snag. Ground check found serviceable. Well, he's ground checked it, he's found it serviceable. Fixed. Okay, please report further. I think I'll just leave in a bracket to come back to if, I'm, if I may. But basically, aircraft broke, aircraft fixed, airworthy aeroplane. Now, I just talked about being signed out. There are two other aspects of the airworthiness of an aeroplane. And one is that it's got to have a certificate of maintenance review and a certificate of release to service. Now, in simple terms, simple pilot, the certificate of maintenance review is a computer system that says or counts off the number of hours to the next check, you know, major check or check for whatever. And that is an engineering function. It's done through the computer system, through FICO, going into engineering computer systems. And their maintenance review is such now that we do not see the certificate on board the aircraft in the tech log. We don't even see it at all. It's an engineering function, it's a properly dele delegated function, and it's approved by the CAA. Okay? And that works for BA. If you were flying for somebody else, then there would be a different approved procedure. The certificate of release to service, to all intents and purposes, means that, on the one hand, right, it was broke, it's now fixed, it's released to service. 
But in addition, we know that the aeroplane will have a regular ramp check, ramp 1, 2, 3, and 4. And for practical purposes, in short haul, as far as I know, um, it hasn't changed from one per calendar day, per GMT calendar day. And in long haul, it's in essence about once every 48 hours, which for us means to say that at London there will be a, a ramp check. And if it's on the ground in Sydney, I'll get another one. Uh, and again, from the point of view of what needs to be done in that regard, then it's properly left to a delegated responsibility in engineering. Now, we know that London or Gatwick, we should see a ramp check. We know when the aeroplane comes out of the hangar, it will have a ramp check. If in doubt, ask. Because at the moment, the ops manual, and indeed the description of how the um, uh, tech log works, does not, is silent about when the ramp check occurs. So um, I'm sure that will be amended in due course, but it's silent. So therefore, you don't know. You use your, um, your wit and you ask, should this have a ramp check if you were picking up an aeroplane? Let's say a, a good example, um, an engine change required in Johannesburg. So it's been on the ground there for a period of time. Well, I would expect a ramp check. Uh, prior to um, uh, departure, and I would ask uh, the engineering um, personnel who were um, uh, supporting me for that departure whether it needed one, and take them at their word. It's great. Okay, that to all intents and purposes is a certificate of release to service. It changes the log reference number, and that, of course, is reflected elsewhere in the tech log and is something that you should routinely check. And because there are two parts of it, you need to check into the, uh, the sub-part that is the cabin technical log. Certificate of release to service. Okay. It's got certificate of airworthiness. Maintenance review will take for granted. It's got a ramp check. What else does it need to go flying? Well, it needs, of course, the transit check. And the transit check is something that you do always when you do your walk round, but it is also done by engineering normally at stations where we have our, uh, our own engineers or um, contract engineers. And they will walk around the aeroplane and sign off the transit check. And there will always be a transit check prior to departure. And the ramp check is written in here, and so is the transit check these days. And it is, if you like, those things that give you the certificate of release to service. So, we start with an airworthy aeroplane, we've got a ramp check at the appropriate time, we've got a transit check, and those are the signatures that you need in order to go flying. Okay, so let's just think about the occasions when the good engineer right, can't fix the aeroplane. Okay, so we've got aircraft broke, but in this case, it can't be fixed. So, what then? Well, the aeroplane is either unairworthy and you can't go flying, major that they can't fix, number one engine's blown up, let's say. Or, the alternative is that it is an acceptable deferred defect. Okay, an acceptable deferred defect. Now, to be an acceptable deferred defect, to be an ADD, it has to figure in one of several places. But let us just for the moment deal with the minimum equipment list, which is our responsibility in conjunction with engineering. Now, the manufacturer's minimum equipment list is developed by the manufacturer, manufacturer in exactly the same way 
as the aeroplane was designed. Those amongst you who are aeronautical engineers will know that the aeroplane when it's designed is designed fail safe so that a failure will be taken down to 1 in 10 to the um, minus 7, 10 to the minus 9th depending on what sort of piece of equipment it is. So a wing falling off is probably 10 to the minus 9 for instance. And that minus 7 to minus 9, that's from memory. I used to know this stuff. In the event of a minimum equipment list, then the manufacturer says, well if this bit has failed, if we assume a related failure, do we still get to a position of safety that's 10 to the minus 7th, 10 to the minus 9th? And if that's the case, it will figure as an approved deviation, approved um, deviation from the general airworthiness of the aeroplane. You can carry it. So, one, the ADD. In transferring, of that snag to the acceptable deferred defects part, either a performance or non-performance, the engineer is required to move it verbatim. And herein lies the first of the problem. Because if you, Commander, have not written up that snag correctly, then it lies in the ADD incorrectly. And what usually happens is you arrive at a place, you describe the snag to the uh, ground engineer, and say, oh yeah, that's okay, we can ADD that. And in fact, the minimum equipment list reference does not necessarily reflect that snag as written. So you need to know what the absolute minimum requirement is for a snag. What is it? Well, it is the fault report manual code, the status code, which is at eight figures. What it says, APU generator US order, and the message number. And the message number is important because that will take the engineers to the correct place in the maintenance manual for any troubleshooting. That's the absolute minimum requirement. Of course, the more or the, the better you can describe the snag, the defect, the more likely it is that the, this bit will properly reflect the snag. And if there is an alleviation in the minimum equipment list, and when your colleagues come to look it up, they'll say, oh yeah, that alleviation matches that snag, that's okay. So let us be absolutely sure about if there is a snag and it is an acceptable deferred defect, there will be, there will be an alleviation in the minimum equipment list. And it will be specific to that snag. Now there are other deviations that are allowed. One is from the maintenance manual and one is on a, uh, an engineering authority basis. But for the particular aspect I want to concentrate on, I'm focusing on the minimum equipment list, part of the operations manual available to you, Commander, not only in flight but on the ground. Now, a couple of things about the minimum equipment. What about, let's say, a, a bulb has gone in the um, uh, you know, back of the flight deck? Does that need to be written up? Yes, it's a snag on the airplane, it's a defect on the airplane, it needs to go in the maintenance law. Is it going to affect flight course now? Does it need to be relieved, relieved under the minimum equipment list? Yes. Yes. And it is relieved under the 0500 area of the minimum equipment list, which is a non airworthiness item. But you, Commander, under the law, have the responsibility of writing every snag up on your defect up on your flight. 
and it will be relieved under the minimum equipment list, or not. And if it's not relieved, you do not have an airworthy aeroplane. If it is relieved, then by definition, it is airworthy. Albeit that you must realise that the minimum equipment list focuses on a single snag at a time. Okay. Now, that means to say, if you've got a list of defects in the acceptable deferred defects, then sometimes the minimum equipment list will make relation to other parts, you know, reverses and brakes, for instance. Sometimes it won't, because each individual defect is looked at and with its own failure analysis problem or, or, or uh, workings. And because it's far too complex to imagine the various combinations of defects, the MEL, an equipment list, looks quite focusedly on the individual defect. Now we have said that, and I hope agreed, that a snag that has a relief in the minimum equipment list gives you an airworthy aeroplane. But if there were a series of snags that individually have relief, You may say, Commander, using your expertise and experience, that the summary of that lot does not leave me with an airworthy aeroplane, in my opinion. Now, of course, you don't do that wantonly, and it will be in conversation with engineering, perhaps even with flight ops management. But let's say you have a series of related grouped problems with the automatics and the flight director and something and you add all that up and say actually this bunch together leaves me with an aeroplane which I believe to be unairworthy and so you might say well you need to fix one of these three problems don't care which one it is but one of them needs to be fixed so I can go from now that's entirely different now here we are we need to be clear. A single ADD relieved by the minimum equipment list leaves you with an airworthy aeroplane. You go fly it. A series of ADDs that are related in some way may give you, in your opinion, in your opinion, an unairworthy aeroplane. Commander, it is only your opinion that counts, because that is a responsibility under the air navigation order. Now, it is true to say that you may say, that lot, to me, is unairworthy. And I may come along, or somebody else may come along and say, well, actually, it's not good, but it ain't unairworthy. And that's okay, because it is the opinion of the commander that counts. So if that happens to you, don't, uh, don't get too upset about it. But I want to be clear, we're talking about airworthy and unairworthy. Airworthy and unairworthy. Now, there are snags on, on the aeroplane <clears throat> that can be relieved by engineering in the same way that we're relieving them in the minimum equipment. So the maintenance manual, for instance, will allow a crack to propagate to a certain length. And if the crack's um, below that length, then it will say something along the lines of within maintenance manual limits. Okay, that's fine. That's exactly the same as our previous position, aircraft fixed. And there may be an engineering uh, operations instructions, engineering authority instruction, which says that given that snag, it's okay to go flying providing there is this series of um, inspections taking place prior to every flight or whatever. And again, that's an engineering function and I'm not really terribly interested in it. And there's also an engineering authority because British Airways have got some you know, quite brilliant uh, aeronautical engineers 
and they are allowed to make their own failure analysis under certain circumstances and give an authority to go flying and that's an EOA okay? and again that's an engineering function and I trust them and I trust them and you trust them because that's the only way it can be and anyway they're bloody good really technical services engineers are extraordinarily experienced and bright people so, from our point of view, the minimum equipment list will relieve a snag or not, give us an alleviation, to go flying with that snag or not. Does we go flying? Doesn't? We don't. Now, within that, both you, Commander, and Engineering are required to use your common sense. The MEL makes no relation um, makes no mention of the fact that the right wing has to be there and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, within the bounds of reasonableness, if I can put it in those terms, it will be in the MEL, either as a specific item or as a non-airworthiness item. And it is incumbent on you, Commander, in checking the airworthiness of the aeroplane because you're responsible to make sure that any acceptable deferred defects are properly relieved. And if they're properly relieved, you've got an airworthy airplane. A word about CAT Q. Right. In the minimum equipment list, you will find um, time periods very often that a defect is allowed to be carried on the aeroplane. It's worth thinking through what that means. Now, British Airways found that the longer they allowed ADDs to build up, the more likely it was that we were going to lose um, a service because the aeroplane fell over. So, as a discipline to itself, British Airways puts cat cues. Uh, the time limit that we're going to carry this particular defect until it gets fixed. Now, that aspect of self-discipline, if you like, needs to be viewed from the point of view of engineering. So, uh, this particular defect on this particular aeroplane is planned to come in the hangar on Tuesday night. But during Tuesday, 27 other aeroplanes fall down with bigger problems. So what are engineering going to do? They're going to fix the bigger problems. And the snag that we've been carrying for 10 days is going to get the extension. Now, again, that's an engineering function. And it's uh, not something that we uh, will do lightly, but it's something that's done out of necessity if the aeroplane can't be fixed on the appropriate scheduled um, uh, occasion. Now there are aspects of the minimum equipment list that aren't British Airways control. The CAA take a view that they don't particularly like aeroplanes flying around the sky with, let's say, pneumatic problems. And so in those circumstances, it's the authority, the CAA, that says, right, 10 days is as long as you're going to have on this. A um, flight data recorder is a good example. We might say, okay, well, we'll go forever. Um, but the CAA says no more than whatever it is, 24 hours. Now, in those circumstances, if engineering can't fix it, it's up to engineering to go to the CAA and explain why they can't fix it and to get CAA approval to extend the CAT queue or not. And the CAA will make up their mind and the aeroplane will either be grounded or will get an extension. But once again, this is an engineering function. Now, from your point of view, Commander, the issue is this. If given this particular defect, the aeroplane was okay to go flying, it was airworthy yesterday, right? but there's a CAC-Q end there, <coughs> the question is, is it fit airworthy to go flying on this day <coughs> with that same snag? <coughs> Excuse me. 
don't know the answer. Of course it is. If it was okay to go flying with that snake there, it's okay to go flying with that snake there. The issue is, if you like, a paperwork issue that is an engineering responsibility. Yeah, of course we check it and we'll, we'll bring it to their attention if it looks like we're coming to the end of the sequence, but that is an engineering function of ours. If it was airworthy yesterday with that snag, it's airworthy tomorrow with that snag. It's airworthy today with that snag. Okay, I said I'd come back to the bit on the right hand side of the tech log that is concerned with hydraulics oil and fuel and essentially this allows you to comply with that part of the air navigation order that says that you are responsible for carrying sufficient oil and fuel and so your signature here at the bottom says one of several things that you are satisfied that the aeroplane is airworthy in all respects what we've just been discussing and that you're carrying sufficient fuel and oil and in terms of fuel obviously it's not just the quantity but also it's the distribution if you've got uh, several tanks and it's got to be distributed properly around the aircraft type so that signature is that in fact encapsulating another number of things that you are accepting Okay, now there are a couple of other things I just wanted to cover because they catch people out from time to time and you know, forewarned is forearmed isn't it? Do you know, I wonder, what ATA means? ATA is the Airline Transport Association which was set up years and years ago and one of the things that they did was that they um, realised that it was important to be able to refer consistently to different bits of the aeroplane. And therefore, each part of the aeroplane has an ATA chapter number. So from memory, ATA chapter 21 is flying controls, but don't quote me, it's around there somewhere in the 20s. Now the important thing to realise is that we've got a mess here, let me just uh, make a little bit of space. If that's the wing and that's the flap, one of the flaps, that bit there may well have a reference of 210602. The chapter number and its subparts. Now, the reason that I'm telling you this is because the minimum equipment list book is split into two. One is the minimum equipment list, which we've been talking about, and the other is defective or missing equipment. Now, that bit, if it was missing or defective, would not be in the body of the minimum equipment list, it will be in that part which currently lies in the front of the minimum equipment list book, which is missing and defective equipment. And you can imagine that the potential for a cock up is quite large. Have I seen it happen? Of course I've seen it happen. So you go for 210602 in, it, in the body, but actually you want 20, 210602 in the front. And if you go into the minimum equipment list next time you go flying and you... Flaps is a good example. If you go into Flaps you will find what I'm talking about. The same chapter number referring to different things. In the one case it's a minimum equipment list, it's an alleviation for something that's tough. And in the other case it's um, either for missing equipment or damaged equipment. ATA chapter numbers. And the last thing I said I'd come back to is no fault found. If you read the how to do it bit in the back of the technical log, it will say that if an engineer 
says no fault found, please report further, then he has got to write that in the next page, i.e. the page that you're going to use to go flying, as an item number. So please report further, which usually just lies in a tech log page and is forgotten, actually has a requirement for a new entry. And if the good engineer hasn't done his job properly well, Commander, that's your job to sweep up after him. No fault found, has a procedure, please report further, has the procedure that requires that entry in the technical log page for the sector that you are going to take the airplane flying. The last thing that I want to cover before we leave the technical log is this. Let us say that you are given an aeroplane with an unserviceable APU and asked to go flying to Delhi in the middle of the monsoon where it's 40 degrees. The question I ask the class is, what are you going to do? Are you going to go flying or not? Usually there's a split. Um, what I want to do is to establish absolutely that if the aeroplane is airworthy and British Airways says go fly it, then Commander, you go fly it. If the aeroplane is unairworthy and they say go fly it, you don't go fly it because you're not allowed to under the law. If British Airways say that you um, give you a, an airworthy aeroplane, but it is, in your opinion, stupid to go fly this thing, I mean, the passengers, there's a passenger comfort issue, there are all sorts of other problems, right? operational problems. Then the way to handle that is to get on, to, what I will do is get off the aeroplane, get on the phone privately to Ops Control and say, look, this is daft. Well, we've got a, a USAPU and it's 40 degrees in Delhi and it's going to be disastrous to take 400 passengers there. And they'll say something along the lines of, well, Colin, look, if you don't, there are no hotel rooms here in London. Um, we're not going, we haven't got a spare aeroplane. We, we'll have more problems here um, with dealing with those passengers. So what we'd like you to do is to take it, even though we know what the operational problems are, and we'll do our best to get air conditioning and all the rest of the stuff. Okay, so the issue is that I now know what the circumstances are I have had my, if you like, conversation, my argument about the merits of this operation, but I was under absolutely no illusion that if operations control said go fly it, and I had an airworthy aeroplane, it was my responsibility to lead the operation and fly it. Very important. We've had a number of commanders that have got themselves into deep trouble. And quite rightly so, quite rightly so, I have absolutely no qualms whatever of turning down an aeroplane because I genuinely believe it to be unairworthy. But I will never turn down an aeroplane or turn down a flight because of operational inconvenience. Because my contract is such that British Airways, in the forms of operations control or whatever part of the the um, you know, the, the company organisation says there's a, an airworthy aeroplane, Colin, I'll go fly. Of course I will, and of course you will. Don't get yourself into a muddle or into a position where you say I'm not going to fly it because it's. Stupid to go and fly. It's wrong for the passengers or it's whatever. Because you're on very, very, very sticky ground.
it doesn't mean to say you don't exercise good leadership. It doesn't mean to say that you don't have um, a, a proper conversation, uh, a calm argument, if I could put it in those terms, with those people that are trying to tell you to go flying. And I'm talking about airworthiness issues here, of course. Um, the, uh, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if you have an airworthy airplane, you go fly it. You go fly it. Well, it's about this time during the day when I like to take time out to talk a little bit about air safety. But before I do, if you're wondering about the change of background, it's because as part of my convalescence, I've come here to the mountains, to our chalet, and whilst the family are out skiing, I did decide to do these couple of pieces to camera. Air safety in British Airways, a subject very, very close to my heart, and the reason being, of course, not only as a line pilot and as a training captain, member of British Airways, but because I was head of air safety, actually was head of safety um, for British Airways, so it's both air and ground safety, but the important bit that I want to uh, concentrate on is air safety. And it was during my watch that we gave birth to the British Airways Safety Information System basis, which you, of course, will be very familiar with. A little bit of history. The industry for years have been talking about trying to create a common database that airlines could use to interrogate trend data to try and project that so that um, the industry could provide preventative action to stop those incidents developing into accidents because no rocket science as we all know any accident is always a chain of events and the theory has always served the industry extremely well that if you um, if something can go wrong it will go wrong so you try to put in place either um, a technical fix or a training fix some sort of fix to stop that particular event being part of the accident chain so my crew created basis in fact it was written the program was written by one of my colleagues and the uh, happily, the, his intellectual property rights were bought by British Airways and it's been developed um, ever since uh, that time and is now effectively the industry standard. Bought by many airlines and indeed um, the ALPA itself in the United States. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is because you ought to know some of the things that perhaps you take for granted. For instance, British Airways, in its predecessor companies, BOAC and BEA, developed, to all intents and purposes, digital flight data recording analysis, what we know as SESMA. It was done, uh, essentially, to gather data for CAT2 and CAT3 landing capability. And initially it was held on the Trident and indeed on the 707 and developed, essentially, for the industry. Now, it seems to me that in 2004, it is to the United States' great discredit that there's still, as far as I know, is not a single US airline that has a digital flight data recording analysis program. So, routinely, they have absolutely no idea what air traffic control are asking aircraft to do on the one hand, and indeed what their aircraft are doing on another. Now, of course, there's a history behind that as well. It is essentially because of the litigious nature of um, the American society, and it will take a big airline with a um, chief executive or chairman of great vision to incorporate the sort of thing that we take day to day for granted. Now, of course, those early digital flight data recorder analysis programs were developed into what we now have, which is a very, very, very sophisticated system. Our SESMA program has provided us in British Airways and indeed the industry with an enormous amount of useful data that has enabled us to enhance safety. And to put it in simple terms, the program, if you like, has a, a tube that has too high, too fast, too slow, too fast. 
um, or too low uh, around it and providing the aircraft each flight stays within the flight envelope that tube then the program just records but doesn't fire an event however if the airplane for any reason strays out of those parameters then it will trigger an event and it triggers a great ream of paper that is viewed by your SESMA reps and the representatives of um, on the Flight Data Recording Analysis Program, SESMA Program for British Airways, in order that the guys and girls can try to understand what went on. Those pieces of information, if you like, can sometimes be, um, if you like, absolutely self-evident. There has been a um, a speed excursion, let's say fast, and pr prior to that there's been turbulence, uh, that significant turbulence, and the guys can say to them, so, well, the reason we got outside the envelope is that there was a bit of turbulence. Equally, there might be a uh, high energy, high speed approach, and it will have triggered an event, and the guys will say to themselves, well, why did that happen, and why, most importantly, wasn't it followed by a go-round, let's say, if it wasn't. So, the important thing to realise is this, that SESMA is a trend data analysis programme. And we have defended that, we British Airways and the Union Balpa, because it has been so valuable. There are any number of um, changes in our operation and indeed the operation of the industry that have occurred because of the SESMA programme. Uh, one that immediately comes to mind when runway res resurfacing was going on, 737 was showing huge G-spikes just before rotation at a certain runway in Europe. And of course it was because the uh, gradient of the t tarmac, if you want, as, uh, as it was being replaced, was too steep. And therefore, you know, the modern standard is a, a lesser slope, if you like, to stop the, the G-Sprite uh, in these circumstances. We had um, uh, an aeroplane that was floating around at 1500 feet about 15 miles short of Dakar when we had gone back in there after a long period of ax uh, um, absence. And of course when we looked at the Adran ed plate we found that indeed AirAd at that time just picked up the state minima which indeed had the guys flying around at 1,500 feet, 50 miles before the aircraft, before the airfield. And so that was the introduction of the advisory heights that you find in the right-hand side, bottom side of the Edran plate, and so on and so forth. It also stopped sightseeing around the Caribbean, uh, which is not a bad thing. And the result is, that our operation today is just miles safer than it would have been without that program. Now, as far as you and I are concerned as line pilots, we may never stray outside the tube, if you like, the flight envelope, and therefore never trigger an event. But that, I have to say, is highly unlikely. There may be occasions when um, we fly the aeroplane in a way in which it flies outside the envelope, creates an event. And it's either self-evident to the flight data recording analysis team or it isn't. If it isn't, then you are likely to get a phone call from your BALPA representative. And the way it works in British Airways is this, that there is only one manager in British Airways who can identify the crew who were flying the aeroplane when the event was triggered. And he, it's currently he, guards that information, if you like, with his life. And so the methodology is that if more information is required from the crew, then the crew members' names are passed to the Balpa rep, who will then get on the phone or find you in the corridor and take you away and ask you about the circumstances of the event. Now, this has worked extremely well because what it is not, Sesma, 
is not a means to chase rogues. Now, you need to understand that along with your five letter code, my name is Siank, that I am assigned a, a code that is a, a complete um, random code so that alongside the event uh, that I have is let's say X123794 and the reason is that if let's say we had a series of fast rotations and it's the same code that is attached to each one we know that there is an individual and it's an individual problem but let's say there's a series of events of the same type but all with different codes and that gives us an indication that it's not a an individual problem it's let's say a fleet problem therefore it might be a training issue back to the friendly phone call from your Balparat he or she will ring you up and say, do you remember a flight between A and B on the such and such date? To which the answer may be yes or no, because sometimes events occur and you didn't know that they were happening. Other times it's quite revealing. Yeah, well, I thought I was a bit hot and high at that point, but I didn't think I was busting a gate and I went on and landed. And you're liable then to receive from your um, friendly Balpa rep um, what is it to all intents and purposes of bollocking. Well, this did actually happen. This was the, or these were the parameters of the event and you should have gone around or whatever it was. But most importantly, that information then comes back on an anonymous, I can't say it now, on an anonymous basis to the flight data recording committee so that it can be decided whether we've got a, a training issue for the fleet or whether it's a newsletter item highlighting a particular aspect or whatever. And so that over time we collect these sorts of um, events and we ascertain whether we've got a problem and then we try and deal with it. What a fantastic position to be in.